Welcome to another iteration of the ASMBS Bariatric Happy Hour. Um, tonight, we will be discussing one of our journal club um, topics or one of our journal articles. I'm very, very pleased to announce that we have Dr. Brett Howell joining us. But first, I want to start with some announcements. Um, so a couple of things to go over. First of all, um, please, please, guys, sign up for Be Safe. If you go to this website, you can do the written test on there. And the next um, session where you'll be able to do the practical exam will be at Sages in lovely Cleveland, Ohio. Um, the second thing is that we have uh, the fellow project coming up and we'll have Dr. Francisco Rubino joining us. This is going to be an excellent session that's happening on the 2nd of February. And the next happy hour session will be on a slightly different date. We usually do the 4th. Thursday of the month. Um, it is a leap year. We're actually going with the fifth this one. So it will be on the 29th of February. So please look out for announcements about each of these things and then um, sign up as well for Be Safe. Tonight, we'll be talking about MASH and MACE. Um, we're discussing an article. Oops, sorry, I have it's not in the Lancet. It's actually in JAMA, um, but the title is correct. And we'll have this evening joining with us Dr. Brett Howe and Dr. Park. So Dr. Stacy Brett Howe is a bariatric surgeon and professor of surgery at The Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio, where he serves as the interim chief of uh, quality and patient safety officer and the medical director of supply chain management. He completed his residency at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego and did his fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic. He is the past president of ASMBS. We all know him as one of the godfathers of bariatrics. Um, and he served as a chair for multiple committees in um, ASMBS and in the American College of Surgeons. He's on the American Board of Surgery, General Surgery Board, where he also chairs the qualifying exam committee. We all know Dr. Brett Howe is very prolific. He's published over 200 peer review articles, over 40 book chapters, and he's co-edited four textbooks on bariatric surgery. So we're delighted to have him tonight. Dr. Park comes to us. She's currently at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Uh, she's originally from Seoul, Korea, uh, moved to the U.S. when she was at a young age. She did her undergraduate in neuroscience and graduated with high distinction from the University of Virginia. Um, she went on to get her medical degree from Virginia Tech in 2018. Uh, she recently completed her general surgery residency at Stony Brook um, and was awarded the Senior Resident uh, of the Year Award. Uh, she's now, as I mentioned, in Bariatric Fellowship, and we're looking forward to see all the wonderful things that she does in her career. So welcome to both of you guys. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us, and I will turn it over at this point. Um, to Dr. Park so she can talk about the people. Um, I will also remind the audience that throughout the session, you guys are welcome to uh, post questions in the chat, to raise your hand, or to um, comment in the Q&A. Thank you, everyone. Let me just get my slides. Let's see here. All right, can everyone see that? Yep. Okay, okay. all right. So thank you everybody once again. Uh, the paper that I'll be talking about is the Association of Bariatric Surgery with Major Adverse Liver and Cardiovascular Outcomes in Patients with Biopsy Proven uh, Non-Alcoholic Steatohepatitis. It was written by Dr. Minion et al. and Dr. Bethel was one of our, uh, the authors on the paper. Um, it was in the November 2021 issue of JAMA. So going over some of the background first. Um, so non-alcoholic steatohepatitis is a hepatic manifestation of metabolic syndrome. It's a leading cause of cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma, um, and it can affect a lot of things, including cardiovascular issues in the future. Um, if you look at the diagram below, it shows essentially the progression of uh, fatty liver disease, um, starting with a healthy liver, going all the way to cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that uh, with for diagnosis and management of NASH, it's still pretty challenging. The actual diagnosis still needs a liver biopsy. Um, all of our imaging abilities and lab values are still not the most accurate way to diagnose NASH. And on top of that, there is no FDA or EMA approved drug therapies that currently exist for NASH. So one of the things that we can do with bariatric surgery is possibly have a positive impact on uh, our patients with NASH um, with the fact that 
perhaps with bariatric surgery, we're uh, reducing excess body weight, improving hyperglycemia, hypertension, lipidemia, and so forth. Um, and this could all lead to improvements in our patients with NASH. Um, there have been some studies in the past that looked at uh, liver uh, biopsy samples in patients who had bariatric surgery pre and post-op, and they did see that there were some positive impacts um, from bariatric surgery um, histologically. And there were some other studies that looked at um, bariatric surgery and saw that there was a decrease in cardiovascular events in those patients. So this study was trying to put both of those ideas together, and they created the Splendor study, which is the surgical procedures and long-term effectiveness in NASH disease and obesity risk. The major aim of the study was to investigate the relationship between uh, bariatric surgery, uh, surgical procedures, and the development of major adverse liver outcomes and major adverse cardiovascular events. All right. The way that they did this was with a retrospective cohort study. Um, they included patients who underwent liver biopsy at Cleveland Clinic from 2004 to 2016. Um, they included patients who were 18 to 80 years old uh, with a BMI greater than 30 uh, and a confirmed histological diagnosis of NASH. Um, and for that, they were looking at uh, factors of liver steatosis, hepatocyte ballooning, and lobular inflammation. And an uh, experienced pathologist rated those levels to get that. Um, and these patients needed to get uh, needed to have fibrosis on baseline liver biopsy. Things that they excluded were cirrhosis, other liver diseases, excess alcohol use, hepatocellular carcinoma, organ transplant, HIV, dialysis, heart failure, cancer, and TPN. Um, so with that, they were able to get 1,158 patients and they split it into two groups, the surgical group and the non-surgical group. They had 650 patients in the surgical group split into a uh, sleeper bypass. Um, other bariatric operations were not included in the study. Um, and then they had 508 patients in the non-surgical group. The big primary endpoint that they were looking for was incidence of major adverse liver outcomes and major adverse cardiovascular events. Um, they had a secondary point that they were looking for, which was just weight loss and uh, HbA1c levels. I'm not gonna act like I know statistics, which I know very minimal of, but the way that they did it was with um, overlap weighting analysis, which is a propensity uh, scoring method of trying to balance out the two groups to basically try to match them as if um, the patients in one group uh, have a certain ability to be in the other group by weighing some of the co uh, confounding factors that they have. And with that, they also looked at cumulative incidence estimates, um, on a Kaplan-Meier non-parametric method um, to uh, uh, basically see what the, in 10 years, what the risks, uh, the absolute risk differences in these patients and what the possible uh, estimates of those events would be in those 10 years. So with that, they had 1,158 patients, like we said, 537 bypass, 113 sleeved, 508 were non-surgical. The median follow-up of these patients were seven years. The median age was 49, 62% of them were women, 40% were uh, with diabetes and 8.4% were current smokers. Um, this table here is basically showing the um, histological non-alcoholic body liver disease activity scores um, of all the patients uh, before their biopsies, uh, of their biopsies. Um, and with that, the overweight uh, overlap weighting analyses that they did were for the va values of age, sex, smoking status, presence of diabetes, histological, non-alcoholic fatty liver activity score, and the liver fibrosis staging. So both basically all of those things were weighted to basically have two groups that were um, more evenly balanced for their analyses. And this was the big table that they had for their analysis. Um, that's showing the cumulative incidence estimates for uh, major adverse liver outcomes and major adverse cardiovascular events. And the unweighted group, um, uh, unweighted data set that they had, um, the bariatric surgery group had five patients who had major adverse liver outcomes compared to 40 patients who were the non-surgical patients. Um, and with the overlap weighted analysis, they got a cumulative incidence uh, uh, for major adverse liver outcomes at 10 years to be 2.3% in the bariatric surgery group and much higher at 9.6% in the non-surgical group. 
And that was an absolute risk difference of 12.4%. And for graph B over here is showing the cardiovascular events. Um, and the unweighted data, they had 39 patients in the bariatric surgery group and 60 patients in the non-surgical group who had uh, cardiovascular events. Um, and with their uh, weighted analysis and the cumulative incidence in 10 years, they estimated that 8.5% in the bariatric surgery group and then 15.7% in the non-surgical group um, would have a major cardiovascular event in 10 years. And this chart is basically showing the same uh, results of that and showing that all of those values are statistically significant. And in the little corner over here, it, it's, I don't know if you guys can see with everyone's faces on it, but it's supposed to show um, what the um, unweighted, unadjusted data set um, had for all the patients in the surgical and the non-surgical group. And basically the patients in the non-surgical group had higher rates of cirrhosis compared to the uh, surgical group. And they also had higher rates of coronary artery events or MIs in the non-surgical group. And this is for their secondary outcomes that they were looking at. Um, for body weight and HbA1c levels, they saw that the bariatric surgery patients had a 22% decrease um, uh, estimate over 10 years um, uh, with the bariatric surgery group compared to the non-surgical group, which was only about 4%. And for HbA1c, it was a decrease of 1.6% in over 10 years. So in the end, uh, bariatric surgery is associated with a lower risk of major adverse liver outcomes and major adverse cardiovascular events in patients with NASH and obesity. And this was uh, supposedly the first paper to really report that this is a good treatment option for patients to, uh, with NASH to try to decrease major clinical outcomes in them. Um, so they are reporting that there's an 88% lower risk of progression to major adverse liver outcomes and 86% lower risk of progression to uh, major adverse cardiovascular events. Uh, if these patients go bariatric surgery. Some of the limitations that this study wanted to talk about um, was with uh, the challenges in interpreting liver biopsies for the overall fact that with um, pathologists reading it, there's different ways that certain pathologists might read certain uh, slides. So there's always a change in interpretation for that. Um, and the fact that so certain confounding factors are unable to be controlled with overlap weighting and then lastly, the fact that um, even with five to 600 patients in each group, they still had pretty low numbers of adverse outcomes, which is great, but it's hard to make accurate models off of that sometimes. So in the end, among patients with um, national obesity, bariatric surgery um, compared with non-surgical management was associated with a significantly lower risk of incident of major uh, adverse liver outcomes and MACE. Thank you, everybody, for letting me speak. These are a few questions that I had when I was looking through the article and some things that we can just go through and discuss if everyone wants to speak. So actually, can we let Dr. Brett Howell go ahead and give his comments first? Of course. Yeah, that was great, Jean. Thanks so much. Um, uh, you know, this was really um, the third of three studies that Ali Minion uh, published Um using the same methodology and really the intent was to, we had the numbers and the follow-up period to really do all that propensity matching and overlap matching to approximate a randomized trial as much as you can without doing a randomized trial. Um, and particularly with, with NASH, there's not a lot of equipoise in randomizing somebody to no treatment, which is essentially what they have versus, you know, something that we know works. And so I think this, this is really um, some of the best data we have. And again, all credit goes to Ali uh, up at the clinic, his, his team. And, um, you know, he partnered with Steve Nissen, who's a really well-renowned cardiac uh, investigator. And they have a really robust team to help do a lot of this complicated um, statistical stuff, which I also don't understand beyond its surface. But I, I sort of get the gist of it and understand what what the intent of it is. And that is to really try to square up your two groups before you do your analysis. Um, the one thing I would add to your limitations is, and maybe it's not a limitation, but it's a, something to note is that this is a, a combination of sleeves and bypasses. 
Um, yeah, we excluded a few bands that were sort of still in the database, but um, the other two studies, and I'm just going to show you the summaries from a couple of the uh, the first two in this series. But uh, you know, I think I think we all recognize that the the sleeve and the bypass have different metabolic effects, and so we we didn't pull out those surgical types because we were really aiming for a a, a JAMA type or a New England type audience, and um, you know, I think it's cleaner just to say bariatric surgery um, because that's the take home message. But I think among surgeons, I think we recognize that we might see some differentiation in some of these outcomes with a bypass compared to a sleeve. Both are good metabolic operations. Both are very effective for all of these outcomes. But I think the randomized data that we have, and then a lot of um, a lot of non-randomized data would suggest that the bypass is it's a little more potent metabolic operation. Um, and then maybe in a few years when there's enough, you know, when anastomosis DS is being done, we can start looking at those super metabolic. Operations that really have those metabolic effects. And so this, this is really not the definitive study, but I really think that it's, um, it's created awareness among the non-surgical uh, physicians who deal with these diseases that, you know, th this is another, another good reason to refer your patients for bariatric surgery um, among many, but NASH was kind of the, the, the one thing that um, there wasn't a ton of high level data on. And so I really congratulate Ali and his team um, and thank them for including me, but um, they really did all the work here. I was going to show you a couple other studies real quick. I'm going to share my screen. And, and really, this is, again, this was, these were, um, these were studies that we've published over the last probably five years. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. I can't tell if this is yours. Is it? It's the uh, uh, cardiovascular outcomes in patients with type yeah. 2 diabetes. Okay. Yeah. Yep. It's just, I yep. used, I used Jen's format. I just added on yeah. a few slides at the end. Okay. So. Uh, and I'm a UT Knoxville grad. I did my MBA there, so I feel perfectly entitled to use their <laughs> um, their slide deck. Fair. In fact, I still teach for the MBA class there. So, um, so again, sim very similar methodology. Uh, it's going to look a lot like the, the paper that you just saw, but this really focused on just cardiovascular outcomes, and it focused on those patients with type two diabetes, okay, and obesity, of course. But this was really the first one that they did with using this sort of methodology to, to um, look at the long-term composite cardiovascular outcomes. And you can see the numbers down at the bottom. There was a match, propensity match, the surgical group. Um, and kind of the take-home message on the left, you'll see it's a six-outcome uh, six composite score. And that, out, that composite consists of coronary events, cerebrovascular events, heart failure, AFib, nephropathy, and all-cause mortality. Um, and you can see a very quick and sustained divergence between the surgery group and the non-surgical group. And then the secondary composite was a three-component uh, score of all-cause mortality, MI, and ischemic stroke. Um, and again, um, significant reduction, 38% um, reduction in these uh, events uh, with surgery. And again, this was sleeves and bypasses. So again, these look very similar. It's a, it's a very similar group. We're just looking at different endpoints. Um, and when you look at these, if you look at these partic particular endpoints um, individually, the curves all look very similar. Some are more pronounced than others. We see a much bigger difference in heart failure. Uh, whoops. And um, some of these other um, things like nephropathy, uh, maybe a little bit less in cerebrovascular disease, but the message is there that uh, medical therapy for things that, that there is good medical therapy for. Dr. how you're freezing up a little bit. Not effective as a foot. We didn't have a lot of good data um, on these hard endpoints. And that's what the internists, the cardiac surgeons, or the cardi uh, cardiologists, and some of these other specialists really care about. It's the hard endpoints. And I think these are the kinds of studies that have started to demonstrate those hard endpoints are there. And then um, this was the second of the three in the series. Uh, again, these all these were published in JAMA, and um, uh, and this was looking at cancer. So 13 obesity-related cancers, very similar methodology. 
Um, and um, there's, you know, again, very early and sustained divergence in these curves with significant uh, risk reduction for obesity-related cancers, total cancer cases, and obesity and cancer-related deaths. So uh, the same, similar methodology, but I thought you would want to be aware if you're given grand rounds, if you're given talking to a medical audience uh, or even her colleagues, I think these are, these are, these, these graphs tell the pretty complete story of what bariatric surgery can do for patients with Hmm. I hope we haven't lost them. I wasn't worried before, but now I'm worried. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think until we get him back, um, I will encourage you guys to, uh, oh, to post in the chat. Um, hopefully he'll rejoin. Let me actually just message him really quickly. Well, the thing that I think is so fascinating about these studies, because the, the medical kind of community really for a long time, was insistent that you had to have randomized control trials to prove your point. And with something like bariatric surgery, that is very, very hard to do. And it's very expensive. Hey buddies. Sorry, my dogs. Um, but the thing I think is so fascinating about all these studies is the timeline that it takes six, seven, eight years to see the differences. And I think that the time our timeline has just been too short to really recognize how vital bariatric surgery is for mitigating a lot of these diseases. Sorry, Dr. Brett, how we yeah, I, I don't know when I cut out, but hopefully you heard most of what I had to say. Sorry about that. Um, but what I ended with, in case you didn't hear it, was I think you know, cancer is a big, a big opportunity for us in terms of risk reduction, not just a primary cancer risk reduction, but secondary and tertiary risk reduction in terms of recurrence rates in those patients who have obese cancers and, and need to get some weight off. So um, the other big question in my mind is where, where are the GLP-1 uh, mm -hmm. receptor agonists fitting into this? Um, you know, is that, that's significant weight loss too. Are we, are we, um, I don't see, well, I don't think we'll see the magnitude of impact, but I'm, I bet it's better than current medical therapy of course with the with the degree of weight loss that we're seeing so um hopefully i won't drop off again but appreciate everybody's attention and i think this is a really interesting topic and and thanks julie and and, and yeah. june laurel and adrian for putting this together it's great well can i um just start off by asking you a couple of questions well i guess sure. i'll just start with one and then we can go to the audience mm -hmm. so you mentioned the distinction between a sleeve and a bypass so when you see a patient who is you know first time visit with you and comes in and has nash like which surgery are you offering to them so it, it's always um a decision that's based on several things not just one so you know Probably the first decision tree for me with between that, assuming that BMI is under 50, uh, there's no other, you know, multiple abdominal operations, huge hernias and things like that, that would push me towards the sleeve. All other things being equal, my decision points are reflux. If they've got severe reflux, they're on daily PPIs or have uh, endoscopically confirmed evidence of reflux or a large hiatal hernia. I, I really strongly favor a bypass in those patients. Um, diabetes. Um, is the kind of another decision point. If they have early diabetes less than five years on oral medication, we've shown in at the clinic some of the studies we've done there in terms of our risk, our risk calculation score for remission, both operations are more than enough to get them into the remission for most of them. If they're in stage diabetes, meaning that they've been on insulin uh, over 10 years, they uh, really don't have a lot of uh, beta cell function left. Actually, it's a very similar outcome for both operations and neither are very good. So you can make an argument that the sleeve is from a risk benefit standpoint, okay in those long standing. I still tend to go more towards a bypass. It's that middle group that have sort of, they're, they're starting on insulin, they're heading down that 
down that progression uh, towards uh, beta cell failure, and they really have a significant improvement in diabetes with a bypass versus a sleeve. So that's how I think about it, where they're at on that spectrum of diabetes and where, you know, what operation is going to provide the best, um, best improvement that. And tied in with that is other metabolic conditions and things like that. But um, the, the, the NASH is, it's one of those things. Occasionally we'll get sent somebody because their hepatologist or internist send them to us because they know they have NASH. I tend to favor a bypass in those patients because they tend to also have a lot of other, you know, visceral fat metabolic syndrome. And usually those are patients who I, in my opinion, benefit more from a bypass than a sleeve. Um, we're still a program that does about 60% bypass um, mm. that, compared to sleep. So we, we offer in, in, in a lot of revisional stuff too, but for our primary cases, uh, we still do a lot of gastric bypasses. And I, I still think it's a discussion that takes a little extra time, but it's worth having so that you can kind of match up the, the patient's, uh, comorbidities, their, their expectations, uh, the risks of each surgery with them and have that, have that more informed discussion. Yeah, we had a, a question here in our Q and A, um, somewhat along those lines, um, from Dr. Osman saying, in patients with preoperative NASH, if they progress uh, to cirrhosis after mm -hmm. surgery, kind of what's your management when you know now they have a gastric bypass and um, they don't specify it, but um, I would imagine the issue of progressing to transplant you know, I generally try to do sleeves in patients I think are going to end up with a transplant, but it is, mm -hmm. you know, true that some patients with bariatric surgery progress to cirrhosis. Um, they do. And I, I don't think someone, the fact that they've had a gastric bypass is not a showstopper for the transplant surgeons, honestly. Um, you know, we can always put a remnant G tube in or post-op if they need help with immunosuppression, but I, and I've done gastric bypasses in uh, post-transplant patients too. Uh, and the sleeve has evolved. I think we just, people have gotten a much more comfort, comfort level with the sleeve in those patients um, getting access to the bowel ducts and stuff, but sorry. Um, but the, um, you know, if you can work around a bypass, if you have to in a liver, in a liver transplant patient, um, there was another part of your question. I can't remember what it was. Do you what's your, what's kind of your management strategy? Do you do anything different? I mean, my post transplant patients obviously are on tons of steroids and a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. They gain weight, which is very yeah. for everybody. And you know, I would worry about yeah. in bypasses. Yeah, they're just complicated patients. They need a lot of a lot of care, a lot of attention to the details. Um, I have not had, honestly, this is purely anecdotal. I haven't had a ton of problems with patients who end up on chronic steroids. Occasionally we'll see an ulcer or something, but I, I don't think that's, um, that doesn't worry me about as much as somebody starts smoking again, for instance, in terms of ulcers and complications. So um, I'm, I, gotta, I guess over the years, got a comfort level with managing the bypass patients after uh, before or after transplant. The other thing, pre-transplant, if they're heading down that road, uh, it's nice to say, we'll just do a sleeve, but if their BMI is 55, boy, it's tough to get them to 35 with a sleeve sometimes. And sometimes you have that conversation, you know, I, this may not be the perfect operation for, it's the only way you're going to get to 35 and the only way you're going to get transplanted. So we can have to have to have those discussions as well. Adrian, I think you have your hand up. Yeah. Thank you, Julia. So, yeah. Stacy, thank you for the wonderful review and the great points you've made. And there's a couple of things you mentioned that I want to make sure don't don't get lost um, for our fellows. <clears throat> Number one, we see some very um, well done uh, randomized control studies for medical therapy with high numbers of patients. Uh, we can't replicate that in bariatric surgery very easily. But also, um, you mentioned this is as close as we can do a a randomized control study without actually doing one. Um, our medical colleagues don't necessarily care about your systolic blood pressure or your hemoglobin A1C as much as they care about the actual event where the mm -hmm. rubber is the road, number one. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really important. And the other thing is if you could share with the, with our fellows the complexities and intricacies and difficulties of actually doing something like Stampede that you're very closely involved with, uh, we see very low numbers, 
or or the Rome trial, you know, Duck and Groney's trial, where we have low numbers, but how difficult it is to actually pull some of that off with with surgery. Yeah, randomized trials and surgery are difficult difficult um certainly randomized having randomized groups from you know comparing medical to surgical therapy makes adds a level of difficulty um a lot of that you know honestly has to do with how the study's funded um it's easier to recruit patients if you're paying for their operation and their follow up care um so stampede was heavily funded you know with with uh industry to uh, and and ultimately the NIH to uh, support the surgeries and the follow-up care. And there was a crossover opportunity for those that ha were assigned to medical therapy to cross over after the five-year period to a surgical procedure. So all that has to be built in so that it's somewhat palatable for somebody who um, comes in the office. But we we really couldn't recruit out of our normal patients, right? You can't recruit out of somebody coming to your office for a bariatric procedure. You had to recruit out of the diabetes patient population, primary care, uh, and, you know, find those few patients that are going to diabetes clinic who about or would entertain the idea of having an operation. And so recruitment took um, about three times longer than we expected. Um, if you didn't know, Stampede was initially designed to compare the band and the bypass to medical therapy. Uh, because, the, you know, again, industry sponsored, uh, there wasn't a company We had the uh, tap in headaches you run into when you're trying to form these trials, but ultimately we couldn't we couldn't get support to get the bands done. So we, and the sleeve was starting to emerge. This was back in 2005, 2006. Um, it was still a pretty new operation actually when the study was designed. So it was it could have it could have really been meaningless if the sleeve had failed, uh, you know, as a, as an operation. But fortunately, it didn't, and it's um, proven to be data that's useful. But the uh, yeah the, that was the original design. But we switched to sleeve, uh, and and um, again three years to recruit a lot of FTE supporting just the day to day recruitment follow up uh, and management. It was it's a tremendous amount of work, um, especially when you have a medical arm. And then we had really good partnership with our um, diabetes mm -hmm. specialist Sangita Kashup was our, our lead diabetologist, and she really you know. Uh, individually managed all those patients with that intensive medical therapy. And that was a ton of work too. So, uh, but it's been, it was a fruitful study and had a lot of good results. It's not the definitive, you know, answer to anything. It's a very selected group of patients who have lower BMIs, who have very severe diabetes. Uh, and so it's not generalizable to everybody with diabetes, but I think it had a, had a pretty big impact. Do you have a just general rough, very rough estimate of like FTEs over the five years and, and total costs just for scale. Oh, the five years, well over 10 million. Uh -huh. um, the initial initial grant was somewhere about 6 million uh, and everything always runs over and long. Um, so there was additional funding that came. We also partnered with Steve Nissen and his uh, cardiac research group at the clinic who basically provided a lot of those FTEs so we had, you know, tons of people on that side for, um, doing all the stats and doing a lot of the analytics. Uh, we had, I think, I think two or three people full, full time assigned to do recruitments and follow up. Uh, and then um, a whole team of folks, um, of course, the clinical folks that were just doing the doing the stuff. But from a research standpoint, I think it was it was a team of probably poor people. And then lots of other people who gave some time to the project. I mean, that's that's just massive. I have trouble yeah. keeping track of my like student I president. I know it was, yeah. And Phil Shower obviously ran it, and he you know got it across the finish line. Which there were times when we were wondering if it would ever go. But um, you know, the, the nice thing when you do a randomized trial up front, think of all the sub studies, all the other questions you want to answer, because we drew blood, we checked sex hormones, we looked at every, you know, gut hormones. And so all the sub studies that come out of it are really great uh, incentives for people to get on board because they have a little niche and they can get a blood test and they can now they've got randomized data they can use for their their own little study and sub study. So it 
if you're doing a big project like that, pull every, all the stakeholders in, get a, get opinions, get thoughts, and try to try to nail down all the stuff you want to do and get all the as many questions as you can answered, because the hard work is the randomization and the and the follow up. But once you get the data, you've got a kind of a gold mine of data to to look at and things to look at. Yeah. Do you want to see the next question, uh, Julianne? Uh, yeah, sure. I was just about to say, I, you know, it, it's very labor intensive. Um, you know, I wonder if we were doing this at like a small facility, if that would have been even possible. Um, but I will go on to the next question. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a question from the audience asking whether you think that the fatty liver disease, the NASH, actually affects the post-operative weight loss. I don't, you mean less weight loss or more weight loss? I don't, I don't think so. I think it's, um, I think it's purely weight related, metabolic related. And I think the, I have not seen any data and I'm not aware of anything that says patients with NASH would lose less weight or have a less of a, a less of improvement overall. Now they are in that category of metabolic patients and metabolic disease. And so that may be a different group than somebody who doesn't have any metabolic challenges, but among that patient group, I, I don't think NASH in and of itself has been shown to, to have a direct impact on, on weight outcomes. Do you think um, that the changes that we're seeing is a function of actual weight loss, or do you think there's something specific to the operations? I mean, this is kind of along the lines of you mentioning the the GLP one. Um, yeah, I think I think the root cause is is the is the weight loss. It's inflammation, right? I mean, that's what you get fat, side adipokines, and uh, like you know cellular inflammation, and that's where that's that whole spectrum of you know NASH to fibrosis to cirrhosis. The the um, you know, I think getting getting the the fat the amount of adiposity down. Just in and of itself, you're 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 eliminating that source of inflammation within the you know the muscles for insulin resistance, within the liver for insulin resistance and and inflammation. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think the weight loss drives most of this. Um, having said that, it's not that simple. I mean, we we do have all the gut hormones and all the the accretin effects um, and things that we probably don't even really know about or understand yet that are having an impact, but. Um, I think fundamentally it's the weight loss that drives the majority of that improvement. Have Have you done subgroup analysis between sleeve and bypass and NASH uh, outcomes? Uh, not with this kind of robust um, methodology, no. I, it's I, Maybe I'll call Ali and see if he, he's done it. I, I haven't seen it published, but it's a good question to ask. Because, yes. um, you know, <laughs> I think it's it's helpful. Like if somebody comes to you with NASH, all other things being equal, they don't have a lot of other reasons to have one or the other. That may be a you know talk a decision point for you if you say you know, yeah. Like I said, it just sort of intuitively, I think the bypass is a better metabolic operation. I think um, I think show bypass is is a little oh. bit better, but maybe they're maybe they're equal. Maybe it doesn't matter, and it's it's just weight dependent. So I yeah you know, I don't know. Yeah, it might be the best data we have to look at uh, for a really long time. So yeah, now I'll talk to really and see if he's looked at that. Yeah. If the numbers, if you have enough numbers to be able to do that kind of. Yeah, that, that, may, be, that may be the challenge, but um, I can certainly ask him. Uh, sorry about that, Dr. Barho. You're actually breaking up a little bit intermittently throughout this session. I'm sorry. I'm oh, sorry. No, okay. Um, so I didn't mean to interrupt you just now, um, but mm. I was going to say, uh, Dr. Park has a question as well. Mm. Yeah, this is for basically everyone here, but I was just curious what everyone's policies on liver biopsies with your bypass or sleep patients. Do you do it for every patient? Selective, no one. I do liver biopsies if I see something that would be concerning for cirrhosis. So like low platelets, evidence of portal hypertension on a CT scan or other signs of potential cirrhosis, um, nodular liver on a CT, 
even when we have people with elevated LFTs and we ask them, we ask hepatology to see them, they don't usually get bi uh, biopsies. Um, but I would defer to other experts as well. It was just our practice at the clinic for a long time. Adrian knows this. Just you, at the end of the case, you did a true cut needle biopsy, um, which is great when you want to publish this kind of stuff. Where, where, it, where it was challenging is... Um, you know, you tell the, you know, you get on the post-op visit and you're like, we got your liver biopsy back and it shows that you have, you know, NASH or this level of fibrosis or whatever. And, and by the way, so there's really, don't worry, but you know, don't worry. It was always a weird conversation. And if you send them to hepatology, they'll be like, you just had a gastric bypass. Why are you, you know, you're going to get better. So it, 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 from a, from a practical standpoint, a clinical standpoint, it, it, it wasn't that helpful, but, um, but I'm with you, Laura. I, I, also, I rarely do liver biopsies now, unless, you know, surprisingly, the liver looks really nodular or if I've been, if they're sent to me with NASH and, you know, they've had a liver biopsy, I will do another one, just a follow-up one for the, for the hepatologist while I'm there. Uh, but I don't routinely do them anymore. I would specify preoperative. If I was intra-op and they had a nodular mm -hmm. liver that was unknown prior, I would yeah. definitely get a biopsy for yeah. sure. Do you, Adrian, do you still do them? So I want to say I agree with everything you've said. I don't think they're clinically that um, that helpful, but I do, we do do them routinely. And um, <clears throat> just for so the fellows understand with the economic standpoint, uh, this insurance companies will not reimburse for those. And that's yeah. okay. We don't use a true cut, which may incur some cost. We actually have an instrument that does a wedge liver biopsy, and we just cauterize it. So it's essentially... No cost for that, but uh, of course, there's a fee for the pathology. And at the end of the day, the diagnosis is um, a pathologic one, right? You need to to look for ballooning and steatosis, mm -hmm. those things. And um, I presented to the patient, like uh, Stacy said, it could be an awkward conversation. But if it is, if it does have findings, I, I tell them, look, it's one more reason to have done this kind of a silent killer, a harbinger of metabolic disease that yeah. uh, that you're going to prevent some potential um, liver outcome that's um, that could impact your health in the future. So, so that's my practice right now. Yeah. So we're doing um, a research study right now. So we're actually trying to get routine biopsies on everyone. Um, I have to say, yeah, I'm not super enthusiastic about it, honestly, because it is very expensive in, from my view, just to get the biopsy done, um, for patients, but, you know, hopefully we'll get some good data from it and we'll, we'll get some good results. I think the hardest part with liver disease is getting the follow-up biopsies after the weight loss and seeing how much has it regressed because yeah. the elastography is not accurate in patients with a thick body wall, um, as right. far as I've read, which I am not an expert on that at all. Um, but there's really no other way to tell if it's resolved, if you had normal labs and normal other imaging yeah. at a time, and it was just a pathologic biopsy diagnosis. So, yeah. So yeah, that it's, was a tough, it's a tough sell to have somebody go get their knee, their liver poked when they're more than likely have got, it's improved yeah, based on what so that was one of my questions about the um, paper. How did you guys follow up on on the NASH to see if it had improved over time? Yeah, the design wasn't it wasn't designed to look at any histologic follow up. It was really those hard endpoints of uh, progression to cirrhosis, liver failure, hepatic failure, carcinoma, or mortality related to liver disease. So those are, I guess, surrogates of or markers of disease progression, um, but we didn't do any histologic follow-up. And, uh, you know, so I was a little surprised we found that many liver biopsies that hadn't had surgery, right? I mean, there's, yeah. I guess that's just the clinic. There's a lot of everything and you can, if you ask the right person, you'll have a, a nice cohort to, to look at, but there's, that's quite a few patients who um, had biopsy proven NASH, Number one, who didn't get sent to the bariatric surgeon to have a discussion, but um, had long-term follow-up. So it was it, it was a convenient uh, comparison group. If you ever need a very large cohort, we probably have a bunch in Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs>
who have positive bio get yeah. sent to a bariatric program. Most, yeah. 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 So there's another question here about progressing cirrhosis. So let's say you did a bypass on a patient. I don't know if you've ever seen this, that their cirrhosis would progress postoperatively. And then how do you manage that patient? Um, I haven't. I, I mean, it may have happened, um, but I can't recall a case where I've done a bypass and they've, they've gone on to progress to um, portal hypertension or need a liver transplant unless... Mm -hmm. No, right at the moment, <laughs> unless, <laughs> and now we'll never know. <laughs> I want to know what it is. <laughs> yeah, well, when he comes back, we'll ask. Well, and I was, one of the other questions is about Sadie's or Bilio BPD DS. Um, and I um, was sent somebody who has developed cirrhosis after getting a switch. So you know, that would be an interesting follow-up question too. And I think the thought is that it's from kind of the malabsorption and the changes in all of your biliary reuptake metabolism changing and, um, but. And potentially from a botched DS where you have bacterial overgrowth, it's important for the fellows to know that uh, the GI bypasses from the seventies actually were abandoned because of liver failure and kidney failure, but mostly because of byproducts from bacterial overgrowth in the intestines. Exactly. And the Copinaro procedure was the first procedure that actually she actually showed improvement of liver disease with mm -hmm. bariatric surgery. Before that, it was thought that bariatric surgery causes liver failure. So if you wonder why we have a little bit of a bad rap amongst the, the older folks that remember it. those cases, yeah. that's partly why. So Hello Stacey, again. we're we're all dying to find out. <laughs> I know that was unless. Yeah, this cut out right when you were you. saying unless. <laughs> unless, sorry, I don't know what's going on with the internet here, but um, the uh, if I get in there and they have evidence of portal hypertension, uh, that's a showstopper for me. Any varices, um, portal gastropathy, those kinds of things. You know, I think um, if we know about those things ahead of time, or even if we discover them in the operation, I think the safest thing is to is bail out. Um, and potentially we've done it where we've gone and take, taken them to get a tips, decompress them and come back when we feel like their portal pressures are at a safe, level. um, those are cases over the years where we've taken those cases on, but, um, most of the time they, they, um, you know, don't get bariatric surgery unless they get their portal pressures down. That was my big unless. Sorry. I <laughs> that's okay. We, we have moved on. always for a sleeve gastrectomy in that situation. Depends on their BMI. I mean, like I just want to get them to 35 so they get a transplant. Yeah, sleep would be my first choice. Um, would you consider doing a BPD or DS, I mean, or Sadie in uh, patients who have NASH? Yeah. Yeah, I don't do, I haven't, I've just not done the Rue and Y DS, but I've done um, uh, the one anastomosis DS for my second stage very large sleeve patients. I think it's a great second stage operation. Some of them have had, you know, NASH. It's, of course, it's gotten better with their sleeve, but I think it continues to get better as, as they lose more weight. Um, yeah, no, I think it's, a, you know, the the malabsorptive operations are are very good metabolic operations. I mean, you're looking at greater than 90% long-term remission of diabetes. It's just that it, there's a lot of trade-offs there that um, that you potentially have to deal with. But um, from a metabolic standpoint, I, I, they're I think the, the best operations. Gosh, I'm trying to imagine doing a liver transplant after a DS or a CD. Yeah. Ugh. I don't even want <laughs> to think about doing a liver get, transplant. Yeah. get more complicated every I know. <laughs> Good times. So you mentioned reflux um, before and, you know, favoring a bypass over it. So there's a question from the audience. When you see a patient who has reflux disease, how do you, um, can you go step-by-step step how you evaluate them, you know, down the path of sleeve versus um, bypass? Yeah. And I, you know, I, some of this is just based on experience. Some of it is, you know, I joined, I joined the program here at OSU five years ago and there, you know, I think we've all kind of 
reached a consensus about how to do it. My personal belief is if somebody doesn't have any real foregut symptoms, they're not having anything that sounds like reflux, they're not taking PPIs every day, I, I don't feel that personally that they needed a preoperative endoscopy. Um, my partners felt strongly that everybody, no matter what you're doing, needs a, needs a preoperative endoscopy. And so now we've kind of hit some middle ground to say that if, they've, if they're on PPI, if they're getting a sleeve, we'll do a preoperative endoscopy. It doesn't probably make much difference for a bypass, but things that would potentially change the plan if they got, you know, Barrett's or um, huge hiatal hernia or something that we weren't suspecting, we may just change to a bypass. So that's kind of my first thing, just, you know, getting the symptomatology, looking at what kind of medicines they're on. If they have the symptoms or they're on PPI daily, they've never had an endoscopy, um, you know, those are the kinds of things we'll look for if we do if we do a pre-op endoscopy. Um, and certainly Barrett's, Barrett's is a pretty hard, hard decision point. Uh, I think it's unwise to do a sleeve in somebody with Barrett's. Um, so they'll get a bypass. Large paras, I would say, it's just, I, I find those sleeves like to slip, slip right back up there in the chest. Um, so I tend to I tend to do bypasses on the large paras uh, with reflux. Uh, and then, you know, just just bad, you know, reflux disease, erosive esophagitis, history of strictures, uh, or just intractable symptoms, which is probably the most common thing. They're just like, I take my PPI, but I'm still, I lay down at night and I'm regurgitating, I'm coughing. They just have an inconfident LES. And um, it, those are the ones where it's, for me, it's a no-brainer. They just need a bypass and the sleeves. It's not the right operation for them. That's kind of how I think I think through it. How about you guys? You scope everybody pre-op, Adrian? I do. Um, uh, we just, um, it's been our practice. So I, I was going to say, <laughs> I remember Stacy and I remember the days when it was, uh, do you want a sleeve or do you want a band? I mean, a bypass or a band. And yeah. that was yeah. how it started. And I think we've gotten a lot better and there's a lot of room to improve to determine which operation is um best for the specific patient standing in front of you. Um, I started doing Sadie about four years ago, and it wasn't that I was bored with everything else. It was just there's a subset of patients that really uh, benefits from that more than any other procedure. Same with bypass, same with sleep. I think it's important that you have to be able to do all of them so you can tailor your care to the patient that's in front of you. And I, I want to echo everything you've said, right? I look at, are they diabetic? Is there evidence of severe metabolic disease? And um, maybe you're setting them up with the sleeve so you can get to a Sadie yeah. and kind of skip sure. the bypass. Um, but you've got to be able to offer them all. So uh, other than that, I, I, um, I do pretty much the same thing. Yeah. And I, I guess I, I wasn't like completely philosophically opposed to scoping everybody pre-op it's with this is a resource issue like endoscopy time you know we all like doing endoscopy but it's probably it's not the best use of a, a surgeon's time in a full day in endoscopy this is based if you're rvu based if you're you know whatever other things you got going on in your practice uh you're better served just being in the operating room but um Having said all that, I think it's important we do endoscopy, facile at it, know what we're because our, our GI colleagues, as much as they um, help us out sometimes, a lot of them just don't know what they're looking at or know what to look for um, when you ask them to do a scope. So it's important we do we do our own when we can. So I, I completely agree. I think we should be a lot more selective and not just uh, treat everybody the same way and just get an upper GI endoscopy. So I, I don't do it in patients over BMI of 60 where I know it's going to be a production and they're going to mm -hmm. want anesthesia and things like that. Um, but we could probably be even more selective with regards to patients who have no symptoms, who are 24 years old. They're not yeah. going to have, they're very unlikely to give anything that's not going to be diagnosed by an upper GI and a uh, H. pylori stool yeah. antigen test. But speaking of selecting uh, patients for appropriate procedures, Stacey, um, you know, being at the forefront of our field, where do you think that's going? How are we going to be able in five, 10 years from now, especially with the advent of AI and other 
technologies and testing to say maybe you get a GLP-1, you get an ESG, you get a SADI. How's that going to develop in your opinion? I mean, my hope is that it, de it develops much like a cancer model, you know, other kind of chronic disease paradigms, but I think cancer is a good one. When we talk about neoadjuvant therapy, you know, surgical therapy, adjuvant therapy, uh, recurrence, you know, non-response, those are the kinds of terms we should be using when we talk about obesity and, and obesity treatment. Um, and honestly, I, I think the GLP-1 agonists are going to help us in the long term. I think it medicalizes obesity better than surgery does. I think it helps people understand that they're that they're 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 deficient in something their body should be making that could help control their hunger. Um, and that, gosh, if I take this shot, I, I'm getting something back that I wasn't making enough of. And much like the reflux, you know, story. Um, you know, if you're if you're covered for it and it's working and you're happy and healthy with it. You could take a medicine the rest of your life, but oh, by the way, we have an operation that can fix this. So you don't have to take medicine all the time uh, because it has the same effects, probably plus some. So I, I think it's bringing more people into uh, thinking about obesity as a disease um, and and thinking, you know, and depression would, you know, or alcohol. There's psychological psychiatric issues, the same thing. Like it's not a, it's not just a weakness or a willpower issue. There's like chemical things that, you know, are deficient or not functioning properly. And that's why we have SSRIs because your brain needs more, you know, serotonin. So it, those are, those are the arguments. I think that the GLP ones will help us make with sort of the non-believers or the people who think that um, what we do isn't, you know, um, necessarily, you know, indicated based on physiology. So Stacy, for our audience of fellows that may be a little bit worried about the dwindling number of cases, you're saying the future's very bright, right? I think it's bright. I think I think we're hitting, we're hitting, we're seeing the effect. Our numbers are down this year too. And um, I think people are trying these things out or seeking them out um, because it's a non-invasive option, um, which is good. I think the more people we get into treatment, the better. I don't, I don't, I don't think it's a killer of bariatric surgery by any stretch. Uh, and I think in the long term, what I do think it'll do is bring more people into uh, into our offices saying, um, I tried the medicine I got, you know, 75 pounds off, but I, I really, you know, need to lose more or, uh, I don't have coverage for it anymore, but, you know, at least I know how I feel when I have that GLP one, um, you know, floating around on my body. So, you know, the, I think it's going to, I think it's going to be a positive, um, and I haven't said this a lot publicly. So, um, I guess you guys are, I'm, you're my test audience for, for this philosophy, but um, the, the longer I've been sort of sitting back and watching, I just think, I think it's a good thing. I think it, um, it brings us a little, what we're doing a little bit more into the mainstream and makes what we do a little more understandable in terms of gut hormones and physiology. And um, you, you can't hardly turn on the radio or a TV program without hearing about, you know, GLP-1 agonists. And that, so I think that's a good thing for us. I totally agree with you because one of the issues that we have in our field is that most of the patients who need help are not actually getting it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's probably one, two percent of patients who actually have bariatric surgery. So I feel like this is going to be a way for us to get more of the population in um, to get, as you said, treatment. So I'm, yeah. I'm actually excited about it. Plus, um, you know, sometimes we use it on our post-op patients as well. So I think, yeah. I think there's definitely utility with the medications. Absolutely. And I, I think um, th that's something that, you know, um, probably is, needs a lot more study too. like when do you intervene? Mm -hmm. uh, if you see a nadir and they're, and they're creeping back up, you know, at what point do you intervene and, and, and what do you use? And in the past, those studies have all been done with fenteramine and atopamax. And, but um, I think, you know, for, for young researchers, this is a really ripe area to, to make an impact and say, you know, pick some points in time after the nadir where you would intervene with specific agents and really study it. And that would help our field a lot. Yeah, I, I feel like the combination of surgery plus the new GLP-1 agonists is something that gets our patients where they thought they would get. Yeah, yeah. 
Like everybody has this idea in their mind and they don't understand what 60% excess weight loss means or 70% excess weight loss. And so they get down to, you know, a BMI of 31 and they're like, wait, but this is it. You yeah. Know? And then you add in Ozempic and all of a sudden they're at a BMI of 26 or 25 and they're yeah. like, yes, you know, and it's like the thing that they wanted. Yeah. So the combination therapy is incredibly powerful. Yeah. Um, and I think it can only help. I mean, it maybe it affects our numbers for a couple of years while everybody's trying it out, but in the long run, it, yeah. it normalizes obesity treatment and makes it okay for everyone to have. And it's yeah. not a big stigma anymore. And it makes it easier for people to look at it more like cancer or something like that. Like if you get you know, your breast cancer removed, you're still going to be on therapy and sometimes lifelong therapy for prevention of recurrence, right? It's, it makes sense. So um, I, like I said, I think it's, I think it's going to be the positive for us. So we're almost out of time, but I want to give Dr. Park an opportunity if she had any um, last comments and then we'll go to Dr. Bright Howell. No, I think you guys answered all of the questions. <laughs> that I had on my slide without me even prompting any of them. So thank you, everyone. Okay. Yeah, thanks for a great presentation, a nice review of the data. I hope this um, conversation was helpful for the fellows. I I was born in Fort Collins, so my favorite beer is Fat Tire. I, I almost <laughs> finished my Fat Tire, um, so we're in good shape. Uh, and thanks, Julie and, uh, and Laura and Adrian for putting this on. It's a great program. Yeah, thank you to both of you guys for being on tonight and to my um, co-hosts. Laura, Adrian, thank you guys both for being here. And of course, the ASMBS for um, supporting us through through the night. Great. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Julian. Good night.